I am Julian Spector. I'm a, a senior reporter at Canary Media, which is nonprofit independent news uh, about the transition to clean energy. Um, I'm joining you today from Honolulu, where I've been doing some reporting. Um, I'm uh, in the offices of the Elemental Accelerator, which uh, David here actually used to used to work with. Uh, and we have Undersecretary uh, for Infrastructure at the Department of Energy. David Crane on the line, joining us from the White House, where you you just stepped out of the uh, the official uh, presidential uh, event, I gather. That's correct. Okay. <laughs> wow. This is I think my first time speaking to someone directly from uh, the White House. Um, so we're here today because it's the one year anniversary of the Inflation Reduction Act, um, and we've been covering that. Uh, for the past year at Canary Media, this this week we, we've uh, organized a whole special uh, week of coverage, and we wanted to thank uh, Core Power, by the way, which is supporting that special package, um, so we can kind of look back on what's happened. Um, the Inflation Reduction Act unleashed the largest ever federal government investment in building clean energy, decarbonizing the whole economy, but starting primarily with the, the electric grid. Uh, and in the past year, we've been seeing developers unveiling a whole swath of new projects and uh, new manufacturers opening up shop in America, which really was never a core part of the, the clean energy industry um, you know, up until this past year. Um, but for this to work, uh, it'll ultimately come down to deploying infrastructure and just changing the physical built environment uh, of our of our national energy system. So uh, that's why we wanted to have uh, the Senate confirmed Undersecretary for Infrastructure, <laughs> David Green, on the line. Um, you're in this new role for the DOE, um, basically making sure these billions of dollars uh, get to their intended destination and uh, bring new technologies to market, bring, uh, you know, uh, re rebuild the grid and make it stronger. Um, so thank you for joining us. Um, it's it's very exciting to, to have you. Um, now, you have a really unique vantage point here because you're, you're sort of new to government. Um, <laughs> most of your career, you were in the private sector, um, most notably as CEO of NRG, one of the biggest independent power producers, you know, generating power or selling it uh, to customers. Um, and you were one of the first executives in that industry to say, hey, we need to look at this clean energy trend is we think that, that the energy system's going more clean, more more distributed. Uh, and you ended up, you know, after some years of, of pushing that way, um, getting pushed out by the board for that thesis. Um, and here we are a decade later, and you're in the government overseeing a massive uh, build out of, of clean energy infrastructure. So I'm curious, you know, looking back from your vantage point now, a year into the IRA, you know, what about your original thesis on clean clean energy has has borne out? And do you think the private sector, the the energy industry, is finally starting to to pay attention to that? <laughs> well, thanks, Julian, and thanks to it's good to see you, and thanks uh, to Canary Media for for having me here. And you know, it's really great to see you. But uh, you know, I didn't know you were going to start by asking a question that was you know, predicated on me getting fired back at the end of 2015. So thanks for raising that with all of your, with all your viewers. Know, but, um, please, but, yeah. but, but, but there is an important point there. You know, the vision I had for NRG as a predominantly fossil fuel based power generation company, recognizing that that was on many levels, uh, that was not a viable long-term strategy for the company. It was not only uh, not a good strategy in terms of classic business terms, it was just morally not right once you realize, you know, what are the consequences of your actions. Um, and, you know, tried to move that company aggressively from brown to green. And it was a very big company, over 50,000 megawatts of conventional power generation. And as you say, like, you know, I got I got stuck mis, uh, midstream and fired. And, you know, there's a cliche in business that's true, that timing is everything. And, you know, you know, one thing that all of us who are in the climate movement, all us climate warriors know is that, um, you know, time is not on our side. We're on the clock. You know, uh, you know, they started us out 15 years ago worrying about 2050. And then, you know, the scientists. So what you really need to be worried about is 2030. 
not mm-hmm. 2050. And so, you know, I, I guess what I'd say to Ty, you know, is is that timing is still everything. And this this bill, which is, you know, uh, to me, I wrote together with the bipartisan infrastructure law. And to us, they're very much two sides of the same coin. You know, this to me, this is the last great opportunity we have basically as the as the human race to, you know, to to bend the curve in a positive direction. And we have to do it right now. So, you know, I was I was pretty happily and comfortably retired when I got the call and they said, you want to come and work in government, which was not something I had spent much of my life contemplating. And it was actually before they had passed the Inflation Reduction Act. And I said, look, mm-hmm. if if you hadn't passed the bipartisan infrastructure law, this would be an extremely short conversation. Uh, but but now this opportunity to 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 implement these uh, two bills forcefully and intelligently, you know, it, for me, it's the honor of a lifetime and, you know, certainly the most important, impactful thing I've ever done. And and it just is realizing the vision that I had and others had, at, you know, NRG just now the timing is right. You know, we have all the tools, you know, everyone gets it now. You know, we're not fighting against 49% of the population or the business population. So, so this is our moment. So we all got, we all have to get this done. Yeah. Gotcha. So it sounds like if, if you were sort of making that argument on your own or lone, lone voice in the, in the business world back a decade ago, sounds very different now. And, and so you, you mentioned the, timelines here. Um, so, you know, the, the president's goal for emissions reductions by 2030 is to, to cut 50% um, based on the 2005 uh, baseline. Um, and based on the early research that's come out, it looks like certainly the Inflation Reduction Act is is the most consequential thing so far to, to push us closer to that goal. Um, but uh, I wrote about for Canary Media today that a lot of the studies are showing we're, we're maybe on track for 40% uh, in the kind of optimistic scenarios based on what we know today and with the IRA in, in force. Um, and that leaves a gap, you know, that's it's 40% instead of 50%. So um, curious how, you know, how, how are you thinking about the outlook as it stands today? And, and what, what do you see as the key levers to, uh, you know, try to close that, that remaining yeah. gap? Yeah, and Julian, look, I could be completely wrong uh, uh, about this, but I think the president's goal is fifty percent from the power sector by twenty thirty five, and then the re- and then the reports that you accurately said today said the Inflation Reduction Act was passed on the idea that it would get forty percent reduction by twenty thirty, and I think the report that my colleagues at the DOE put out today said somewhere between like thirty percent and forty one percent is possible which I think is all good news and very, very important news. But, you know, uh, Julian, everyone's a victim of, of their life experience. And my, my life experience is that when you, when you create a proper framework with proper incentives for the private sector, they outperform and they perform faster. So earlier in my career, in terms of when the, based on the Clean Air Act amendments of 1990, when they went after Sox and Knox, and the power industry originally said, we can't do this in the 20 years you want us to do it. And we ended up getting it all done in 12 years. I mean, when when you mm-hmm. looked about the, the costing down of solar panels in like 2008 and, you know, and everyone's like, oh, they'll never be 30 cents a you know, watt. And, 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 and even a quote unquote visionary like me who really believed in solar, if you had told me like within 10 years, there'd be more solar you know, power produced in the United States than coal power. I'd be like, you're out of your mind. You know, so, yeah. So, yeah. so to me, while you know, these models are helpful, the most important thing is that we, we get the snowball rolling down the hill in the private sector and then it'll move faster and accrete more uh, results and uh, we all win. Yeah, yeah, and and to clarify, so yeah, the I was referencing the Paris the Paris Climate Goals. Oh, okay. For, for the whole economy is is the twenty thirty. Um, there's like the twenty thirty one, but you're right. There's the president also has a twenty thirty five, uh, ideally carbon free grid, electric grid, 
Um, and you know, we'll see, we'll see. Oh, that's we'll right. See. He's that's right. And that's a hundred percent by 2035. Yeah. Well, which, yeah, which is ambitious. We, get, we got our work cut out for ourselves, but we're up. That's for right. It. But, but I've also seen, you know, some of the studies and I think DOE has a new one saying the grid might be 80% clean yeah. by 2030 as a result of the, the policies now in place. Um, the national renewable energy lab, uh, has their optimistic case gets up to maybe 90% carbon free by, by 2030. So, so these are, yeah, you know, no, no, that's it. Investing in American energy. This came out this morning. I encourage everyone to read it rather than to rely on my imperfect statistics. And, and yes, the, the 80% is, is, uh, yes, is in there. Um, and, and I think so. you raise a really good point about, uh, just historically, Clean energy technologies have have all, almost always outperformed expectations, and and uh, you know there's very famous graphs where you see all the the experts oh. saying where solar is going to go and it's going to be flat for for 40 years, and then the real the real life adoption is this exponential growth, and so so I think that is a cause for optimism. I guess to make sure we're covering all our bases here, what what are you most worried about? Uh, as far as obstacles to to reaching that potential, um, given that you're, you're you're looking at infrastructure and and big infrastructure is hard hard to build, there's a lot of there's a lot of potential obstacles there. So what what would you be most worried about getting in the way of hitting those high end uh, projections? So so Julian, first of all, I worry about everything, right? Like the government pays me to worry about everything. We have a lot of programs to implement, a historic amount of money. And of course, it's not just a question about deploying the capital, it's about deploying it intelligently and then making sure that there's the knock-on effect. Because, you know, if we're trying to deploy, say, sixty billion dollars in the in the Department of Energy most of which is done matching the private sector, which has to put in 50% or more that, you know, let's say that means, you know, we directly trigger a hundred to 125 billion of investment, which is great in clean energy technologies. But as we all know, the number we need between now and 2030 is more in the range of a trillion dollars. Right. So the most important thing is that we do things that have a knock on effect and, you know, we don't create these DOE private sector, public private partnerships into these unicorns that are beautiful to look at, but no one in the private sector can replicate them. Mm. So so that's something that I'm uh, focused on. And I'm, you know, and I, you know, and one of the ways is like, I, you know, I'm encouraging my colleagues in the contracting departments to exercise restraint in contracting. You know, yes, we're the government and we can impose our will on the private sector when we're about to award someone a billion dollars. But if we come up with a contract that the private sector would never replicate, then what did we actually accomplish? Hmm. And so so hopefully that it's a new look DOE in, in that way. A couple other things that just I think I'd love you and your uh, readers to focus on. And you you mentioned my start when I when I sort of went down this brown to green path at NRG 10 to 15 years ago, you know, we were out there alone. You know, uh, there there was no other company, you know, in the U.S. power sector that I could say, oh, I'm just going to follow those people. One of, the, one of the hidden risks we have right now is that basically, as far as I can tell, every CEO in America gets it. But what I'm worried about is that we at the DOE have to encourage the pioneers and discourage, uh, you know, the boards of directors that act as conservative speed bumps on CEOs that want to do the right things and say, why don't we be the follower? Why don't we go second? You know, uh, what we don't need at this critical moment in time is a bunch of people looking around for another player in their industry to go first. Um, mm -hmm. And then, you know, the third thing and last thing I'd say what I worry about is I think one of the most impactful uh, pots of money we have is six billion dollars for uh, industrial decarbonization, the so-called hard to abate sectors. I think one of the unfortunate side effects of calling heavy industry hard to abate is that that into that into those industries themselves like have what I you know a decarbonization plan that calls for deep decarbonization not this decade but next decade. To me, the point of our six billion dollars is to to make sure that that those industries now realize you know just because you got labeled hard to abate 
you don't you don't get to sit on your hands for 10 years you know you have to move now or else you're going to be behind yeah you know? so, 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 so a lot of this is about a mindset i'm sorry go ahead oh you don't want it to be a self-fulfilling prophecy that you see yes. all that so they're like yeah well, no way to do that this decade that we're too hard yeah. for that. uh and um yeah and i've been in surprised at how quickly the um, conversations moved on some of the like green steel and some of these things where five years ago, it seemed really impossible. And, and now like companies are already building their plants and, and testing it out at scale. And um, but yeah, speaking of the kind of up and coming technologies, you know, you've been overseeing the, the office of demonstrations and now you're, you've got kind of this bigger, um, purview to, to help bring new energy technologies into the into the mix um, and get them off the ground. Like, w w can you name a, a, what are you most excited about on the new end of the technology spectrum? Or what are some that you think are kind of under underappreciated, like like that, that, that they might have more of a more of a positive impact than people currently realize? Well, you know, uh, yeah, so because, because I like to answer questions literally when you say underappreciated, I'll spare you the hydrogen spiel because, you know, hydrogen is sort of the, the kale of clean energy and that like everyone likes to like talk about it as the, and so, um, so in terms of underappreciated uh, things, well, first of all, I just say the, the, the number of, uh, you know, uh, provisions and mechanisms that we have both in the Inflation Reduction Act and bipartisan infrastructure law to to both strengthen and smarten up the grid. Mm. Um, you know, I mean, there's no one part of it that that you will say, wow, you know, Julian, this is the coolest thing ever. But, you know, between, you know, uh, federal transmission corridors, the, the money for grid modernization, um, you know, uh, I, you know, we all know that, you know, the, we need that transmission back, backbone to build out. And so I, I'm very excited about that. The other thing in terms of underappreciated is, you know, you know, mo um, you know we have these programs, uh, the, the billion dollar numbers are smaller, but they're designed to help people in rural and remote uh, communities. And, you know, it's just, you know, I just have to say as someone who was in the electricity business in the United States for 25 years, and, you know, you used to see these statistics, there are 128 million homes in America, 124 million of them are connected to the grid. And, you know, even people who live in urban poverty, they tend to have lights, right? And, but this, but the fact that there are four to six million homes in America that aren't connected to the grid people, I mean, it seems to me, that the money we can put into the rural and remote areas, it's, it's more a question of energy, you know, access, energy equity than just flat out, you know, s s solving for, you know, for, for agri, you know, total climate as carbon emissions. But, and that's, that's what I love about these two bills is that they seem to have thought of virtually everything, right. Uh, yeah. You know, and, and so, uh, but I do get excited about sort of the, you know, uh, and trying to end energy poverty in the United States. Yeah, no, that's crucial. And I mean, that, that's something the federal government did back in the New Deal with the Tennessee Valley yeah. Authority. And clearly there's still uh, an unfinished project there. Um, are you uh, bullish on, on the so-called long duration energy storage uh, coming into a meaningful role on the grid? Like this would be technologies that can store clean power for days, you know, potentially eventually uh, on a seasonal level. Um, but it's kind of like not something the marketplace really knows what to do with yet. Um, what's your, what's your so, take on that? Well, so the, the main, so first of all, yeah, long duration energy storage and, and uh, we, uh, and we uh, have two programs, a total of 500 million, one that well, two areas of interest, one that's sort of looking for 10 to 24 hour power. And then well, the other one is like 24 to 120 hours. So none of it's actually seasonal, but it but it is, you know, it, it is a critical element. And for us, you know, again, I, I think that that provision was vision very intelligently, given where the technology is to where you know, the, the concentration is to look for non-lithium solutions because, you know, the marketplace differs on when does, 
lithium give way to other technologies. And this gives us a ability to demonstrate that technology. With $500 million, we're not going to be able to, you know, suddenly create, you know, LDES all over the country. But if we can prove technologies at a lower price point, and then we can work with the state PUCs, because as you know, one of the issues on LDES is not, you know, most public service commissions don't know quite what to do with it in terms of rate base. And so we have, I think we can move the needle there. It's just that, you know, we need to do that like all of our programs in concert with other critical players uh, in that area. Yeah, so that's a really good point. Uh, and I'm sure a lot of the listeners know those those acronyms, but you're basically saying if the state utility regulators don't understand this new technology, they, they might not sign off on letting a utility take customer dollars and, and go build it. So, so that'll be an important part of the transition is, is getting, um, you know, making sure all the, all the stakeholders understand what this thing is. Is supposed to be doing that doesn't look like other power plants we've we've seen before. Um, and then you mentioned green hydrogen. Um, I, you know, there's uh, a lot of people in Washington like eagerly awaiting the IRS's guidance on what actually constitutes green hydrogen for the purposes of the tax credit. <laughs> um, do, do you have uh, a view on you know whether these ideas of hourly matching of clean energy to hydrogen production or additionality should should be in there? Well, Julian, you know, I don't sound like a government person, but this, I think for the first time in my life, I'm going to say to you, I don't have any comment on that, yeah. uh, Julian, because yeah. uh, as I'm you say, it's at a, a very sensitive stage so in the discussions. So, so stay tuned to canarymedia.com <laughs> to see where that ends up. Um, well, let's talk about manufacturing um, because, mm -hmm. you know, for, for the whole early part of the, well, at least the last kind of decade pre-Inflation Reduction Act, um, manufacturing just wasn't like top of the priority for most folks in the clean energy industry. And I think there was a kind of tacit uh, acceptance that the way we decarbonize is import the, the most cost-effective materials from elsewhere in the world and install them and the jobs will be installing them and developing. And that would be that. And now just in a year, we've had on the order of $100 billion of private manufacturing investment for clean energy made in the U.S. and, and you know, sent right into the, the supply chain here. Uh, and this is solar, this is batteries, this is uh, electric vehicles, uh, inverters, like all the, all the parts. And, um, you know, you overseeing this infrastructure build out, uh, wh what does it mean to you that we now suddenly have this uh, rising American manufacturing sector? And, and does that does that alter the you know, pace or the, the scale of deployment that we can do? Um, well, I, I think it makes the uh, the pace uh, I think the main, you know, way you would say it would it would be make the the pace more predictable, less, you know, I mean, you know, with the the sunrise of unexpected geopolitical events, you know, which you know sort of, you know, unfortunate for the people involved in them, but sort of timely in terms of all of this is like, you know, it really you know concentrated the mind here in the government that, and you know, I, Julian, I'm an old guy, like like I got interested in energy you know, during the two oil shocks of 1973 and 79, when I was a 16 year old trying to drive around, you know, mm -hmm. and, uh, you have to and, wait in those know, lines to fill up. Um, like, I'm sorry. Did you have to wait in those long lines of cars at the gas station? Yeah. Like, and <laughs> after the 1979 oil shock, I had my first job, like in an aluminum pie pan factory, I'd have to get up at huh. five in the morning to sit in a line, you know, to get my car, you know, uh, yeah. So I went through that and, you know, so we have 40 years of basic de dependence on foreign sources of oil and like, you know, and, you know, there's not much in Washington that everyone seems to agree on, but everyone agrees that we don't want to substitute dependence on overseas manufacturing, in, you know, from countries that aren't, you know, that don't necessarily have the best interests of the United States in mind. And so, Again, I think the, the uh, Inflation Reduction Act, very thoughtful in terms of the, the, the tax provisions. You know, we've, we've just received proposals for 
uh, 48C, which is, you know, ultimately it's a $10 billion provision, you know, 30% off, you know, in sense, small to medium sized manufacturing. We yeah. have a manufacturing supply chain offices that's been putting out solicitations for batteries and, and, you know, is going to be putting out solic- solicitations for conversion of automotive manufacturing facilities and things. And so there's lots of provisions that are focused on this and a lot of incentives for people to buy things that were made in America. And you alluded to it, but, you know, I, you know, we were always looking for this metrics where we measure things, jobs created and things and, you know, money invested, but the mindset shifts that the inflation reduction act have triggered in the, in the minds of the private sector on things like manufacturing is like, you know, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy when the boss suddenly says, look, let's build this this factory in the U.S. And suddenly the people searching for the best factory site, you know, you know, aren't flying to China or Mexico or Vietnam. You know, they're flying around the country. And, mm-hmm. you know, that's that's a that's a win win for the American people. Right. I mean, it's certainly a win on these economic uh, metrics and more jobs here and, and you know, more um Sort of sharing sharing the benefits of the the green transition, um, but yeah, I'm I'm interested in seeing kind of the the ways that it also maybe moves the moves the pace of the transition along faster because it certainly hedges the risk and you know you won't have to worry about uh, materials stuck on a crate somewhere in the Pacific and not <laughs> at your project site on time, which hit almost every major solar and storage project over the last couple of years. Yeah. Um, so, um, yeah. Okay. Well, we've got just a few more minutes. So we'll do, I guess, just briefly, you touched on the, the oil um, question of oil dependence. And, um, you know, I, I feel like that doesn't get talked about very much, but part of the, the impact of the IRA will be to shift uh, energy consumption from, you know, burning oil for vehicles and things to electricity and then producing more clean electricity here. Um, so do you think there's there's a tangible kind of energy security benefit there in terms of diminishing our, our dependence on global oil markets, which we've learned to be volatile? Well, well a- absolutely. And, and that's why this the statistics that um, is in the report that we both alluded to and I held up today that that based on the projections, importation of foreign oil will re- will reduce by somewhere between 45 and 60 percent from now till 2030 with the implementation of the bill. And, you know, I, I always wonder, and, and Julian, there is one thing with your indulgence that I do want to mention, but, you know, I always say like national security is so important, but it's a macro concern, you know, uh, you know, the individual American energy consumers, you know, you know, they want the U S to be strong and not vulnerable, they, but they mainly want energy in their house. Mm-hmm. you know, yeah. that they can afford that's safe and reliable. And so, you know, to me, the, um, you know, and obviously we we are in a, the age of adaptation. So weather resilience and things like this are important in their provisions on that. But, you know, I don't want to get off the phone. I mean, it's called the Inflation Reduction Act, you know, and there were some cynics at the beginning that said, oh, it's a climate bill masquerading as Inflation Reduction Act. But one of the statistics they quoted, uh, you know, in the in the event that's going on in the other other room here is, you know, when this bill was passed a year ago, annualized inflation was eight percent. You know, uh, you know, right now it's it's two percent. You know, coincidence? I don't know. But 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 the report that came out today also said that, you know, we all know that once the upfront capital intensive renewable energy gets built, the cost of operations, marginal costs, you know, is basically zero. The report also says that over uh, by 2030, the, the cumulative savings of American energy consumers from this inflation reduction act will be $38 billion, you know, and that's, you know, that's what you get just by existing and having cheaper electricity prices. But then if you avail yourself, so like we have a rebate program for, for efficiency in households, you know, uh, efficient appliances, you know, if people want to take their own energy destiny into their hands, this isn't all about business to business stuff. There, there, there are consumer facing parts of the Inflation Reduction Act that could basically allow people to take advantage of this government money 
and live a, live their existing lifestyle, even with all the heat, at a much cheaper price. Yeah, and and Canary Media, we've got a whole new s- s- column on electrified life that's all about that and the kind of what you can do in your own life uh, using these these uh, benefits and and other things. Um, well, that's interesting. Yeah, my my final question was going to be, you know, the uh, recent poll from Washington Post and University of Maryland found. So about 71% of Americans say they know little or nothing about the IRA. So what would you want them to, to, to know if you could talk to any of those people? But it sounds like any of, any of those points you just made might work. Any, any, any last kind of tell, tell your friend who doesn't know about the IRA this fun fact? Well, I, well no, I would say tell your friends to pay attention to Canary Media because I think one of the time one of the reasons you get those types of results in polls is because you know you turn on you know the the broad news channels and all you're hearing about is indictments and things like that you're you're not you're not i mean i think people just aren't hearing these stories because there's more sensational news out there but but i but i just think that you know i i'd want to end on a positive note but i but I just think I have to end, you know, we used to say in the electricity business and with a lot of our business being in Texas, as you and I talked about, the month where people think about what they pay for energy is September, because that's when you get your August electricity bill. Mm-hmm. Um, but because of the, you know, the, the, this historic heat wave we had earlier in summer, people are getting their atrocious energy bills this month. And I just, you know, I want to end by being, you know, the, the our Department of Energy, the Biden administration, we're empathetic for people that are, you know, it, it may affect their choice of, you know, feeding their kids, clothing their kids because they, you know, they, they have to live in air conditioned homes. And, you know, the Inflation Reduction Act, you know, doesn't provide an immediate fix to that, but it provides a fix to that over time. And mm. so uh, and so I think that's the most important message I can leave you with. Yeah, cool. Well, I think I think that's all the time we have, and you've got White Housey things uh, to to attend to. So, thank you so much <laughs> for joining us. Thanks to all our audience being here. Um, thanks to Core Power for supporting our anniversary coverage of the IRA. And yeah, if you like what you heard, CanaryMedia.com. You can sign up for the newsletter. You can donate to help us keep our journalism free and, and available to the to the world um and yeah david great great to great to check in and and we'll uh we'll let's stay in touch let's see where this okay. goes okay good